Good afternoon. I'm Melissa Samuels, Director of Alumni Programs at the Albany Alumni Association. Welcome to today's webinar on the art of the difficult conversation. Before we get started, we just ha have two um, housekeeping items I'd like to go over. First, we will be recording the session and I will be sending a link to everyone uh, once that's up on our website. Second, we will be saving time for Q&A at the end of the session. So if you have questions for our speaker, please put them in the Q&A, not in the chat. They might just get overlooked in the chat. So, um, so let's get started. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Nancy Berger. Nancy is a workplace communication strategist and executive coach with more than 20 years of experience in researching, publishing, writing, and teaching about communication. Uh, we've worked together before. She is a dynamic and engaging facilitator who guides individuals and teams to foster healthy cultures and untangle communication knots in the workplace. So Nancy, super excited to have you um, back with us today. Thank you. I was adjusting my 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 screen so you couldn't see my dog crate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all we all have funny things going on behind things us on sometimes the on these but, zooms. But um, yeah, but, Nancy, we had just a really uh, an outstanding response to this webinar. So clearly, this is a topic um, that many of us uh, struggle with or want to learn more about. So I'm excited to hear what you have to share. I'm going to turn the um, the presentation over to you, and I'll see you a little bit later for the Q and A. Great, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for uh, having me here. I was thinking as um, Melissa was speaking that when I graduated from Albany in uh, 1982, it would have been great to have had a course in how to have a difficult conversation or even a major, right? Because as we go through life, it, it, it always comes up and it's always difficult. So I'm gonna share my screen so we can get started. Um, on the okay and before we even launch into this um melissa is going to help me out by taking a quick poll um i would love to know how many yeah have you have you avoided a difficult <laughs> here we go right look at that it's given a minute here I want to get the number because it's always a it's always a an eye opener. So eighty one percent. Okay, it's changing a little bit. Eighty twenty. Eighty percent of you all uh, have avoided a difficult conversation, and, and so there there you go, Melissa. Right, that's why. This is a popular topic. So great. Um, I'm going to 80% of you, for those that are joining on the on the replay, um, I wanted to repeat that. I'm going to try to get to my presentation screen. I'm not sure I can as long as the poll is up. So maybe if we take the poll down, we can go to the slides. I'm just going to go ahead and X out of that. Okay. Um, all right. So, so now that we know why everyone is here, um, let, let's let's get into it. So, before we get started on the steps, so so I'm going to teach you five steps for having difficult conversations. Um, and when you see them, you're probably going to be like, "Wow, why didn't I think of that?" Um, they seem simple, but we don't think of it because we don't think of it, right? And there's reasons for that. What I want to tell you from the get-go is you will have a chance to download at the end of the, the presentation. Uh, there will be a quick, a brief survey I'll ask you to do. There'll be a QR code. You point your, your camera to it. You answer a few brief questions and you'll get to download my 15 page guide that gives you all of these steps and a little extra, you know, some explanation and stuff. So you can have that. Um, so you don't have to worry about scribbling down notes or trying to get it all in, uh, committed to memory. So before we get started, I'm going to give you a little quick neuroscience lesson, okay? Um, because it can really help when you help you contextualize this information when you understand how the human brain works in this space. And what I mean by that is there's lots of pathways in our brain uh, that that deliver us thoughts and ideas, okay? The fight or flight response 
which is that, ooh, right? The thing that happens when you're when you feel a threat. And it's not just a tiger in the room. It's any kind of threat. Uh, originates in the amygdala, which is at the base of our brain, on either side of our brain stem. And in this pathway, when this is activated, we don't really think very well. So think about the last time you were in the team meeting and asked to present or to come up with an idea. And you ever have that, I had this all figured out, now I can't remember a single thing I had prepared. That's because in those moments where you get in that fight or flight, where you're kind of really a little bit freaked out, your cerebral cortex, the logic center of your brain up here, the gray matter, kind of shuts down. Um, so it's important to be able to discern the different kinds of experiences we have and how they trigger our brain. And I don't want to get in the weeds too much on the neuroscience, but I think it's helpful for you to understand that as humans, we, when we get that, the tiger in the room feeling, and, and often we get that feeling when we're going to confront somebody in a, in a difficult conversation, or we're going to try to speak truth that may not land so well on the other side of the table, that can shut down our gray matter, our thinking brain, our logical brain, and our language center. And we just get tongue-tied and knotted up, and we don't know what to do or how to kind of navigate. So I share this with you so you can understand and notice that in yourself the next time you're facing a situation like this, oh, that thing is happening. Let me try to calm my nervous system down so I get back into my thinking brain. And we could do a whole, a whole webinar on those techniques. But for now, I just wanted to give you this back of the envelope. Now, why does that happen? There's a really good reason for that. Why our brain goes into that fight or flight and, and our cerebral cortex kind of shuts down. If you're standing on a train track, and a train is barreling toward you. Are you, is it going to serve you to stand there and weigh your options? Think it through. <laughs> no, it's not. So we are conditioned and we have evolved as a species to get off the train tracks, to run, to flee when we feel a threat. And that's the reason we have survived. But it gets muddled in our modern society when we're dealing with difficult experiences that knot us up, that fight or flight can sometimes get triggered and then we aren't thinking very clearly, okay? So the thing that has helped us survive often hamstrings us when we are trying to communicate. So what we wanna do is stay up in that gray matter. We wanna stay in that part of the brain where we have logic, where we have language and communication because that's where we innovate that's where we connect. That's where we problem solve. That's where all the good stuff kind of happens. So what, what we're talking about today are strategies that will help you stay up there, navigate the difficult conversation, and kind of circumvent the, the fight or flight. And like most new skills, these, this takes practice, just like anything else. So the more you practice these strategies, the better you're going to get at it. Okay, so here's what I'm going to teach you today, the five steps to having a difficult conversation. First, unpack the fear. Figure out what it is you're, you're so freaked out about. Second, discern between fact and fiction. I'm just giving you an overview here. We'll get into each of these. Three, do your job. Four, one of my favorites, don't be sorry. And five, say it and then wait. Okay, so Melissa, here would be a great, great time to do our second poll. So why don't you uh, bring that up for everybody? Give it a second. What do you dread the most about talking through conflict? Making someone else upset? expressing my viewpoints with clarity or losing my nerve and not self-advocating. Hmm. See what, what we find out here. This is a lot more balanced than the first one. Okay, so 46% of you uh, are concerned about making someone else upset. 32% uh, 
are concerned about expressing your viewpoints with clarity, right? Getting that, getting, remembering what you wanted to say. Uh, and 22% losing my nerve and not self-advocating. So kind of a balanced, um, more balanced on this one, but all of these strategies will address that. Okay, thank you for that. So let's keep going. Maybe. Hmm. A little bit frozen here. I'm going to stop sharing and share again. Unfortunately, I got a little bit jammed up there. Hmm. Sorry, guys. Okay. Here we go. Okay, step one. Unpack the fear. What does that mean? So the first step is really spending some time sitting with what it is you're avoiding. And it may sound simplistic and obvious, but I mean really sitting with it, like writing down what are you afraid that's going to happen? Um, a lot of the time you will find, and I have found working with clients and groups, that it's uh, they're going to get upset they're going to get upset. What do you mean exactly? What are they going to get upset about? And the act of writing these things down, writing down a list of things that you're nervous about is very powerful and helpful because when you have to formulate language and, and put these things into words, suddenly they're a little less of a catastrophe. So what do I mean by that? We tend to catastrophize we tend to go 17 steps ahead of ourselves and say, oh, this awful thing is going to happen if I, if I address this issue with this person. If you start writing down what exactly may happen, you can kind of corral that. Oh, okay, they may, they may get defensive. Okay, if they get defensive, then what? We can come together and discuss you know, how it impacted me. We can discuss how it impacted them. These are examples. Uh, and then maybe they'll move from being defensive to being angry. And then you can say, it feels like you're getting angry. Can we talk about that? See, when you can sort of map it out, that, that natural cat catastrophizing that we do gets much more diffused. So it can be a really helpful exercise to articulate what it is you're avoiding and be very specific. Not generalizations like, they won't like me anymore, or they won't want to work with me anymore. Or if you're sitting with a supervisor and giving them feedback, I'll get fired. And it sounds funny, but you'd be surprised how many people jump to that. Um, so be specific, make a list, and then kind of pull those threads to see how likely is it that this is really going to happen. The more you do that, you build muscle, right? When we talk about neural pathways in the brain, they get stronger the more you access them. So when you stay in that measured space, when you stay in that, okay, how likely is this? Let's kind of take some of the emotion out of it, calm things down and look at the likelihood that these things will happen. And also how envision how I will be able to navigate it no matter what is said. So unpacking the fear is a great first step. Um, and something that can can build a great foundation for the rest of the, the steps. All right, step two, fact and fiction. All right, I want you to be honest with yourself right now, all of you. Think about how many times a day you write a story about somebody else. Now, I'm going to tell you that I do it constantly. And why? Because we all do it constantly. Human beings write stories all day, every day. It's how we make sense of our world. And if we are not uh, indulged with facts, we make stories based on whatever we have. So what does that mean? It means when you're standing on the checkout line in the grocery store and the person in front of you has 78 coupons, you write a story that is not terribly kind about them. And we, you know nothing about them right? But we write the story. So it is really essential to discern between fact and fiction. When you're going to have a difficult conversation, before you start spinning this elaborate yarn about what's going to happen and what the other person is going to feel like and what they're going to think of you and all these things, stick to the facts. 
We're meaning makers. All we want to do is make meaning, fill in the blanks, right? But it is really helpful when we can, and again, I'll have people do two, write down two columns, one fact, one fiction, and then take a recent situation you found yourself in, any situation where you noticed that you got agitated or, you know, it was it was related to some a stranger in the shopping mall or somebody on the road that that ticked you off. You wrote a story. If you were to write down two columns, fact and fiction, and fill in both columns, which column do you think is longer? The fiction column is always longer. We make stuff up. And then we look around for evidence to believe the thing we made up. It's called confirmation bias. And it's one of the hundreds of cognitive biases that we suffer from as humans, right? So pay attention to that and resist writing the story. Stick to the facts. What are the facts? What are we talking about right now? What is the gripe or the concern or the truth that I'm about to share? And factually, what are what's the options for this other person? They can disagree, they can, you know, you know, debate. That, but if you stay in that factual space, you will serve yourself a lot better and, and you take out a lot of that emotion and nerves. Okay, so truth without narratives. Um, for this one, um, a, a great example that always resonates with my audiences is a road rage example that I experienced personally during the last presidential election. I was on the road. Somebody in a pickup truck in front of me swerved and cut me off. The pickup truck had a lot of decorations that may, that sort of indicated, you know, their political leanings. I'll leave it at that. And I noted, I was giving a talk that night to a large group and I, and that's why it's so memorable. I noticed myself getting enraged based on a pickup truck and decorations. I knew nothing about the driver. I didn't know if the driver owned the truck. I knew nothing, yet I wrote such an elaborate story and my whole parasympathetic nervous system was activated. I was dry mouth, shaking, angry, and I just started chuckling at myself. So what I did was I wrote a different story. That person who was driving the truck who I couldn't even see was rushing to a 24 hour vet, with the puppy on the passenger side that was, you know, ate something it shouldn't have. My entire nervous system changed, shifted into empathy, compassion. I was calm. I was like, go ahead, go first. It's remarkable what we can do to ourselves. So this applies throughout life, workplace, personal, whatever. But I share that with you because it really is an impactful exercise. When you can notice yourself doing it, you can change it. Okay. Write down. Yes. Step three, do your job. Okay. So in a difficult conversation, your job is to express yourself, speak your truth with compassion, with respect, with kindness, with professionalism. That's your job. But we often take on the other person's job because we want to anticipate, we want to predict how our words will land with them. That's not your job. So you want to avoid that predicting, not because we're being self-centered or uncaring, but because the other person is entrusted with that job, right? They will take your words and interpret them how they will interpret them. And that's fodder for a wonderful discussion, right? But when we take on that job, when we say, oh, if I say it, if I say this, they're going to feel this, we, we, we nod ourselves up. So avoid those predictions. Focus on saying what you want to say with compassion and professionalism. And part of that is starting with I statements. Yes, I know there's no I in team. But when it comes to difficult conversations, I statements are key. They're critical. Why? Because when you start any sentence with you, what happens? The other person is immediately on the defensive, right? They're, they're, the, the, the mindset goes right to, oh, I have to, I have to rebut, I have to defend myself. So 
So you stay with I statements. They can't argue with you. If I say in a difficult conversation, recently I have felt that when I try to disagree with you, you become extremely argumentative. The other person can't say, no, you don't, right? They can't, they can't say that. They can disagree that they could say, I don't mean that, but they can't tell you, you don't feel that way. So when you start with an I statement, it is extremely powerful because you're expressing your own experience and then you're, you're delivering that information so you can come together and have a conversation. Try it, practice it. Um, I, in, in groups and teams, I usually do a skill practice where I, I give you know, examples and have people tr you know, change them all to an I statement. It's, it's extremely helpful. So think about the next thing or that, that conversation 80% of you are avoiding right now. Start it with an I statement and see how different that feels in your body. It really, it really can empower you. Um, and a you made me feel statement is a pretty much a non-starter because you not only put the other person on the defensive, um, but you're, it's not really true. Nobody makes you feel a certain way. Now, let me qualify that. We have feelings. We cannot control them. They come. Thoughts are different. Thoughts are choices. We get feelings and, and that's, that's just the way it is. We can't, you know, stop. But they're based on our inventory of life experience. They happen because we get triggered because of certain things that happen to us throughout our life. Not a blame thing. This is just the way humans are wired. We're socialized. We have first family dynamics that impact us. And when we are in ex have experiences in our life, it triggers different, different thoughts and feelings. Okay. But when you say you made me feel, it, it just, it, it's not laying a groundwork for conversation. It's, it's laying a groundwork for awkward feelings um, rigid thinking and defensiveness. So instead of you made me feel, notice the difference in I feel X. I feel targeted. I feel judged when you say X. I feel uncomfortable when you come to team meetings unprepared. It's a completely different dynamic and it can really smooth out um, that, that awkward conversation. Here's a couple of, of phrases that can be particularly helpful in these situations. Help me understand why, right? Help me understand why you tend to X, Y, Z. Let's figure out how to. Right away, we're in collaborative space. We're in innovative space. We're in problem solving, right? Up in your, up in your gray matter and working together. I have noticed that. These are, I call it inventory of language. A lot of us just lack the inventory of language. We don't have the phrases. We don't have the words. They're not easily accessible to us. And then when you pile on top of that, getting into your fight or flight brain, it just all shuts down and you just, you're tongue tied and you don't know what to say. So these strategies will help you kind of build that inventory, get used to these phrases. They become more automatic the more you practice them. Um, so this is an important step. Okay. St and stop me if there's any questions, um, Melissa. I don't see anything in the chat right now. So um, step four, don't be sorry. For heaven's sake, we are uh, in an apology epidemic. I, I, I don't know if you all experience this. And those of us that have children I have four adult children and um I've actively shut down the apologizing like if there's some sort of a conflict or we disagree about something and then this like string of apologies starts and I actually made a rule no apologizing for 24 hours like we just can't do it um we can talk about it again we can revisit it we can unpack the conversation that we had that was difficult what we learned from it but just no apologizing for give it a day like, let, because it's just, it, it becomes a crutch. So you may find this surprising. You may not. Women apologize more. 
The studies show an interesting thing though. Women don't apologize more because they think they should. It's that we have a lower threshold of what we think requires an apology. So let me explain that a little bit. We just think that more things require an apology than men think. Um, so we're doing it exactly as we think we should, but oftentimes the things that we're apologizing for don't require an apology. So really funny, interesting story. I experienced, I had, I was at, um, getting physical therapy and, uh, I was in a, you know, an open area where there were four practitioners and three were male and one uh, PT was a female and I was doing my exercises or whatever. And the female PT was across the room with her, with her client. And she was working with him on some painful rehab after I think it was knee surgery. And she apologized. I, I counted, I, I lost count at nine. And uh, I, everybody knew each other. It wasn't, I wasn't, being, this wasn't as obnoxious as it sounds right now, but I said, hang on, why are you, you're helping this man? Why are you apologizing? And everybody laughed, you know, and she goes, I know, I don't know why I do that. So it's just something that gets to be automatic. So I would ask you all to check yourself on this. Notice how many times during a normal day or a normal week, you apologize for something. Um, and notice whether or not an apology is required. Um, you know, speaking up at a team meeting or uh, disagreeing with someone doesn't require an apology. You can say a lot of different things, you know, if you want to kind of, you know, cushion the fall a little bit, so to speak, but you don't have to be sorry. You don't have to be sorry for having a different thought. You don't have to be sorry for disagreeing. You don't have to be sorry for standing up for yourself. You know, if you offend someone or you, you know, stub your toe on something, okay. But we apologize a lot more than is necessary. Try this. I disagree because, and explain yourself. But you don't have to be sorry about it. Would you consider, you know, if you're in that conversation and someone says, well, yeah, but I don't want to do the project that way and I don't agree with your approach. Okay, would you consider this approach? If approached from a different angle, we might. Again, we're back to this, what do we have access to? What are we used to saying? So get used to having different language at your disposal because then you're firing different neurons and the more you fire those neurons, the stronger they get. Just like when you go to the gym, and you lift weights, you build those neural pathways and you're more apt to fire the same way the next time you're in that situation. So practicing these uh, strategies is extremely helpful and required in order for you to get more automatic with it. Okay, the fifth, the fifth and final step is say it then wait. What does that mean? We are not, uh, we are not in, innately comfortable with silence. Um, it, it's a challenge for a lot of us to sit in silence. Um, and in, the, in difficult conversations, and even in typical regular conversations, notice if you have to fill silence. Uh, a, a lot of us do. There's, it's, not, it's not a criticism. It's just an observation to make about yourself. Are you are you a person that always has to have the TV on or music on or something going on? It, it may be that you're a little uncomfortable with silence. And when you're in a difficult conversation, silence is a really powerful and important element. And interestingly enough, silence promotes brain growth. This came out of a 2015 study um, where mice were exposed to hours of silence and the hippocampus region of the brain, which is where memory and learning happens, grew. Um, so silence is a, is a beautiful thing to embrace, but it's awfully awkward when you're sitting with someone and you're in a discussion that may be a little awkward and they don't say anything. 
and you feel like you have to like say something or apologize. So, but it builds trust when you sit and witness someone else. I call it listening with your tongue. So when another person is speaking, uh, this is also called active listening. When another person is speaking, and this is even more imperative when it's kind of a prickly conversation, listen with your tongue, <laughs> actually let your tongue flatten in your mouth. There's a reason for it. It calms your parasympathetic nervous system. You cannot go in fight or flight when you relax your tongue. The science backs me up. But um, it also just makes you focus on what the other person is saying instead of just formulating a rebuttal, which is a lot of what we do sometimes in difficult conversations. So listen with your tongue quietly, calmly, and witness that other person. And then when they're finished speaking, give it a minute, process what they've said. And also when you listen with your tongue, guess what? You can't talk, right? So listening, honoring the silence. And if you've just said something and the other person is not speaking, which is, you know, the, the bad sweat starts, right? Say, yeah, to be silent in someone else's presence is a mark of trust. So say, I noticed that you're not saying anything. Do you need a few minutes? Would you like to come back to this conversation after you've had a chance to process it? Or what can I do to, you know, to facilitate this? Would you like to take a break? Would you, you know, say something about it, honor it, but don't try to fill it because that, that doesn't move the needle. That doesn't move things forward. So let's recap. Unpack the fear. Map it out. Write down what you're what you're nervous about. Write down the outcomes that these these catastrophic outcomes that you've you know created in your brain. What is the likelihood that they're really going to happen? Then what? Then what? Then what? Stick to the facts. Discern between fact and fiction, whether it be in the conversation itself or as you're prepping for the conversation. You know, and 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 coming up with all these grand stories. What are the facts? and stick to the facts. Do your job, stay in your lane, you know, present, speak your truth, present your, your thoughts and feelings with compassion and professionalism. And, and by the way, I talk about workplace difficult conversations. This applies to anything because I do not believe that we're different at work. We're, we're, we bring ourselves everywhere, right? We, we bring ourselves everywhere and how we do anything is how we do everything. So while we may think we're a different person at work, um, we're not. And very often when I do this work with clients, I hear back the, uh, the byproducts in their personal relationships, how it improves, you know, how they talk to their partner or their children or their family. So, you know, this, this, this applies to anything. So back to do your job, stay in your lane, Start with I statements, practice them, write them down if you have to. Get those neurons firing so that when you're in that situation and you're a little bit sweaty and your fight or flight is getting triggered, you, you're ready to say the things that you need to say. Check yourself on the apologizing. If it's something that requires an apology, fine. If it's not, if it's diversity of thought, you know, disagreement, self-advocacy, you know, whatever it is, you, you don't have to apologize for it. And then honor silence. Silence builds trust. Um, practice witnessing the other person and listening with your tongue and, and really hearing what they say. And when you respond, weaving that intel into, you know, your response, you'd be surprised how far that will go with taking the temperature down and, uh, and, and moving the needle forward. So those are the five steps. Here's your QR code. Um, just point your camera to it. You'll go to that screen. You'll answer a few questions about the, the talk because it really helps me improve my, um, my facilitations. And then you can download the, the 15 page guide um, 
two difficult conversations. I hope this has been helpful. I would love to hear questions if anyone has. And of course, reach out to me if you have anything offline you want to discuss. Happy to, to chat through um, anything that you may not want to share in a public forum. Okay. Yeah, and I'll be sharing Nancy's um, contact information with everyone in a follow-up email um, once we have the webinar ready to be viewed um, online. So we do have some questions in the Q&A, Nancy, so um, I'll just get started. Um, right. Someone asked, frequently when I start a difficult conversation at work, I feel like I'm doing all the talking. How do I get the other person engaged? Oh, that's a great question. So here we go with that silence thing, right? So try asking them. So you, when you're talking, take a break and ask the question, would you like some time to process? I'd love to hear your thoughts on what I've said already. Uh, is, there, is there anything you'd like to share now? Again, these are just phrases that once you get comfortable, like pulling them out of your toolbox, you, you feel so much more empowered and ready for whatever might happen. So take a pause. If you feel like you're doing all the talking, notice that after you know 30 to 45 seconds, maybe take a pause and ask for weigh-in, ask for them to participate. Um, and they may say, oh, no, I'm not ready yet. Great. Then just do that intermittently. Does that answer the question? I think it does. All right. Okay. Another question. I tend to cry when I'm having a conversation about something I'm really frustrated about, which is really embarrassing. How do I manage this? Yeah. So what that is, is your nervous system is releasing, right? It's all, it's like you're a little pressure cooker. Your, your, your nervous system is all knotted up. And then it, when you finally start talking about it, it can't regulate. So you're, you're dysregulated. So what I would strongly urge you to do, and again, we can talk offline about this, is have a strategy for calming your nervous system before you enter into that conversation about the thing that's frustrating you so much. It can be a meditation. It can be breath work. It can be tapping. All of these things can really be helpful or whatever works for you. If it's, if it's go outside and walk around the block for five minutes, if it's go into the bathroom and put cool water on your face, it doesn't have to be, it has to be something that resonates with you, mm -hmm. um, but some kind of a relaxation technique that will ground you and calm your nervous system because you're dysregulated in that moment. Also, the more prep you do, all the steps, writing down what's going to happen, writing down you know, the then what scenarios, um, try the five steps, do your prep work. You may find that it helps you visualize, fire those neurons, get that language inventory built up, mm -hmm. and then you don't get so frustrated in the moment. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Odette asks, if someone says to us, you made me feel, uh, which we now know we shouldn't do, uh, what words can we say instead of saying, sorry, I didn't mean for you to feel that way? Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, great, question. great question. I'm hearing you say that is a great one. I'm hearing you say that when this happened, you felt blah, blah, blah. So don't, you don't want to debate it with them. And you certainly don't want to say, well, no, I can't make you feel anyway, because then we're just, we're back to square negative one, right? So you say, oh, I'm hearing you say this. Tell me more about that. I really appreciate that feedback. I'd like to do it differently. Let's figure out how to do it differently. These are like, it's, it's, it's like learning a new language in a way, mm, you know, because yeah. when our back gets up, we just say these things that we're used to saying, but try the new phrases, try the, I'm hearing you say, because that validates the other person. And then you ask for, for more information. And then you say, let's figure out how to do it differently. Empowering for both people, kind, respectful, right? Yeah. I'm Can you tell I've had a few of these conversations in my life? <laughs> I, I'm jotting that one down. <laughs> um, okay. So Sue says, it's a little bit long, but I'm going to read the whole thing. I started consulting business working with children and parents. My greatest challenge is charging a fee. If it's a typical one hour session, then that's standard and I'm okay asking for that fee. If I'm writing emails, et cetera, for the family, it takes longer than expected. I feel bad about asking more money. 
I need help. Okay, so I'm going to ask, who, who asked this? This is Sue. Sue, I'm going to ask you this question, and I want you to not answer now. Uh, reach out to me. We can talk offline. But I'm going to ask you this question. Why do you feel bad? Is it that you don't value your own time? Is it that you're anticipating, predicting, assuming that your clients won't value your time? And in either or both of those scenarios, what do you think about that really? Either you not valuing your own time or they're not valuing your time. So, and I'm not trying to be glib, honestly. This is such a common, common issue. Pricing and, and self-advocating and charging for our time and our skill is something that entrepreneurs struggle with all the time. And I might even go out on a limb and say female entrepreneurs struggle more. So in that moment, try to unpack your own thinking around it. Can you, if you are, if you don't charge for your time and your expertise, is your, is your work sustainable and can you help all the people that you want to help? Can you spread your medicine to the world if you do not value your own work? No. So there's, there's, there's nervous system, uh, imposter syndrome, fear-based self-limiting thoughts going on in there. It's kind of like nice little potpourri of things, but it can help you to kind of sit with it and unpack exactly what it is that you're thinking and feeling about it. And I know that's a little obtuse, but it's where I want you to start because this is where I always start when I get asked this question. And I tell you, I get asked it a lot. All right. Someone asks, how do you deal with the frustration you you're feeling from the person that you're talking to? So you're having a conversation and you can just tell they're really frustrated. So deal with the frustration you feel. So you're that it's kind of like you're taking on their reaction or you're taking on their. So I'm sure you've all heard the phrase metacognition, right? Noticing, it really means noticing ourselves. That's a perfect opportunity to metacognate. That's a perfect opportunity to say, hmm, I'm feeling, not out loud in the moment, but like notice what you're feeling and and then think about why. So let's let's just take an example. I'm talking to somebody, having a difficult conversation, telling them that I really didn't like how they showed up at the last team meeting. They said something that made me feel stupid. Aha, uh -huh, they can't do that. They said something that I felt they were they were commenting on what I had just said, and I felt silly and humiliated. Okay. I got kind of like really upset, almost like defensive and kind of snarky. Like I wanted to shut them down. So in that moment, notice what is it that's coming up? We're not good at doing this. We are not good at noticing ourselves in a heated moment. We sometimes knee jerk to a reaction instead of a response. So what I'm asking you to do and really imploring you to do is take a pause and notice the physical manifestations that you're experiencing and then spend some time thinking about the last time you had that same feeling, sometimes this stuff goes way, way back. And while the eye rolls come when I start talking about childhood, I end up doing a lot of work on early life experience, first family dynamics, socialization, modeling. Because for example, somebody might come to me and say, I, somebody did, in fact, one of my coaching clients, I get so like knotted up when I have to do a presentation. This was a senior level utilities executive. I, I don't know what to say. Uh, we ended up back in, you know, home plate. Now I'm not a therapist, but the work that we did was not in that realm. It was just connecting dots between what family members said to her when she was young and expressed a desire to have a career and, you know, and be an executive and how connected dots to how difficult it was for her to show up for herself. So short answer is notice yourself and your reactions and then think about the last time you had that reaction and what comes up for you. Um, more times than not, it's, it's hardwired it's socialization and you can shift out of it. You can reframe those, th those thoughts. It just takes work, practice. Okay. 
Lisa asks, um, I appreciate what you said about apologizing. What if you think you are entitled to have someone else apologize to you and that apology is not forthcoming? Mm. So, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a really interesting scenario. And it's the timing of the question is great because it, it really feeds back into that noticing yourself and your own proclivities, noticing how we tend to think about things. When you want that apology, right? They did wrong and I want them to apologize for it. There's usually a reason that it's not forthcoming because that person doesn't feel like they did anything wrong maybe, or maybe they just came to a talk about how they apologize too much and they're resisting it or whatever the thing is. What I would ask you to do though is focus on what meaning you're attaching to the apology. Sometimes we get ourselves, and I'm not saying that, that this is the case here, but sometimes we get ourselves into a victim mindset where we have been wronged and we're, we just want to, we want someone to acknowledge that we've been wronged. And sometimes we have been, I'm not saying that's not the case. But when you're in a victim mindset, sometimes you can get a little bit myopic, like you're not really seeing the whole picture and it, it doesn't serve you. It, it triggers your nervous system. It gets you into that kind of like, you're, you're, you know, you're angry, you're upset, you're disrupted, you're dysregulated, whatever it is. And then sometimes you get into that fight or flight and you can't really think clearly. So while you may be owed an apology, and I'm not saying you're not, I'm just asking you to consider that there may be more to it than that. You may be attaching a lot of meaning to getting that apology for some other reason. So just notice the facts. What, what, what is it that you really feel you deserve? And are you in a little bit of victim mindset or are you just wishing the communication was clearer? If it's the latter, continue the conversation. That apology might come. Maybe you just have to work it more, pull more threads, get that person to open up a little more. So without having more specifics for your situation, I can't really answer clearly, but there's, I hope I've given you some things to consider. All right. We have a question. I'm happy to say this has never happened to me, but Sheila asks, what if the person slams the door and leaves the room and won't re-engage? Well, that gives you a lot of information. Um, and, and, I, and, and I'm not trying to be funny. That gives you a lot of information. Everyone lives their wounds. Do we all do, whether it's home or work. So that person is, is showing you how wounded they are. That kind of reaction shows significant dysregulation. It's, it's an unprofessional reaction in the workplace, of course. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of stuff going on there which you're probably not even aware of and may have very little to do with the conversation you were having. So what I would suggest is letting it sit. And then you can attempt to re-engage at another time in a different way, if that's appropriate. So without knowing if, is it a colleague? Is it a supervisor? Is it a direct report? Like there's so many things I don't know about this, but that situation shows you that there's definitely work that needs to get done. Um, if, if a colleague slams the door on you and then becomes adversarial or won't even engage with you in the workplace after that, that's a problem, right? So that has to be elevated to, you know, HR, you have to at least talk to your, your, supervisor about it, to try to build connective tissue, not a, they did this and, you know, a, you know, telling, telling tales kind of thing, right. but I want to build this connective tissue. And, and I feel that more work needs to be done. How can we, how can we do this differently? Right. Here's a kind of related question. How many follow-up conversations should you have to an initial conversation after you haven't been able to come to an agreement or improvement in the situation. So how many times do you try and go back and, and address it? So here's the thing. I can't answer that question, but what I can say is this. If you've had to repeatedly have the same conversation with no resolution, then 
it's not a function of how many times to do it. It's a function of you're having the wrong conversation. Like the, you know what I mean? Like you're not, you're not moving forward. If you have to repeatedly have the same conversation, then it's time to try something different. So I would say in a situation like that, I might say to the other person, gosh, I've noticed that we've had this conversation several times and we're not moving the needle. I would really like to do this differently with you. I would like for us to figure out why we can't move the needle. And I think together we can figure that out. What are your thoughts about mm. a good place to start? Not exactly those words, whatever words you choose, but along those lines. Notice that it's not working. If we keep doing it this way, we're not going to get anywhere. I'd like us to do it differently together. Can we figure that out? Where do we start? Because something has to shift. Yeah. You know, what's the definition of insanity, right? So <laughs> something has to shift. If it's more than three times you've had the same conversation. It's not working. It's not working. So yes, yeah, um, I would love to take you to my next difficult conversation, but I'm going to be channeling my inner Nancy next time I have to have one of these. Download the guide. Have a few have more the questions. Guide. So we'll try and get to as many of them as you can. What if the difficult conversation is with your boss and you're afraid there will there will be re repercussions or retaliation? Okay. So again, I don't know the culture in, the, in your company and I don't know your boss, but I will say this. Now, in the landscape that we're all operating in, it is imperative that uh, feedback uh, is a two-way street. If you do not feel that there's psychological safety in your workplace, and you feel that there will be repercussions if you raise um, an issue. Um, that's a that's a that's a macro issue, right? That's a that's something that you have to come to terms with if that's the right place for you. And I'm not suggesting that you leave your job, but what I'm saying is, if you feel like there's a lack of psych psychological safety, you want to bring that to the attention of anybody who cares. Maybe HR, maybe you you have a, a, a employee resource group, something. But if if there really is fear of repercussion, that's an issue. Now, if it's a perceived thing, like you your boss is saying, I really want you to tell me if something's not working for you, and you still fear repercussion, then that may be your own fear-based thought and not really based in reality or fact. So it may be that you start small. You have a meeting with your supervisor and you share something, test the waters uh, before, I don't know how big an issue it is that you want to raise, but test the waters and say, look, I would love to give you some feed forward. I call it feed forward in my executive coaching because you're, you're really trying to improve the situation at work. I would like to give you some feed forward. How do you feel about that? Is, I'd like to do that now. Would you like to do it now? Could we do it in another meeting? Don't apologize and see how that goes. If you feel like it is not well received and you feel uncomfortable and, and overly vulnerable about it, then you may want to raise the issue with uh, someone in HR or, or talk to your colleagues and see if anybody else feels that way and try to make some movement. This is the thing. Everyone in an organization can be a leader. Everyone is in a position to make change. If there's something that's not working, act like a le the leader that you would like to have and ripple effects will, it, it will cause a ripple effect in organizations over time. But in your specific example of talking to a supervisor, try to discern between if it's really that there's going to be repercussions or humiliation, or if you're just operating on your own fear-based thought. If it's the latter, you can shift out of that by starting small and trying to have an open and honest conversation with your supervisor. Okay. All right. Um, someone asked, is there a timeline for how soon or long you can wait before having a difficult conversation? For example, if something happens and you need to process it, how long is too long to initiate that dialogue? I don't think, I, I don't think it's a, there's a too long. I mean, obviously, see, this is this is the reason that's a that's a slippery slope. If you wait, if something happens and you need to process it and you're it's festering, and a week later you go to the person and you say, 
I would like to talk about what happened a week ago. And they're like, why did you wait a week? Well, right there, there's information for you, right? If that's not defensive, I don't know what is, right? So it, it the longer you wait, it could make someone, it could cause someone to say, well, why'd you wait this long? But if you're waiting that long, that could be part of the issue that you're trying to address, that you don't feel comfortable talking about these things. So you see, it's all interconnected and it's kind of hard to answer in a vacuum. What I would say is, generally, this is the advice I give. The sooner you can address it, the better, because it's fresh in people's minds. Process, yes, but there's a fine line between processing and then festering, obsessing, marinating, right? So process so that you give yourself a chance to kind of formulate, you know, your action plan. You know, how do I want to approach this? What are my I statements? How do I want to go about it? Let me look at my five-step guide. Let me visualize. Let me do my then what's. But waiting too long, it may actually work against you because then you, it's not fresh in their mind and they may become even more defensive. So I would say sooner is better. Of course, give yourself a chance to process, but don't let yourself marinate. Nicole asks, um, hi, I find that sometimes difficult conversations ha <clears throat> me, happen around boundary setting. So for example, an executive asking for you to take something on when you know you don't have the bandwidth, but feel like by having the difficult conversation might shine you in a bad light. How would you recommend going about that type of difficult conversation so that you're staying true to yourself, but also looking professional as an engaged employee? I love this question. Boundary setting is so critically important and it takes a lot of courage. So good on you uh, for wanting to do it. What I say in these situations is, again, it goes back to having your toolbox. So when your boss asks you to do something and your bucket is tipping, right? Your project bucket, be ready to say, I would love to help. Let's have a discussion about how I can prioritize my existing commitments so that I can accommodate you. That means I have too many things on my plate and something's going to give. Let's have a conversation about how I can prioritize my existing commitments so that I can accommodate you. You're not saying, oh, sure, sure, I'll do it. And then you go home and you're, you're breaking out in a rash. You say, I'd like to help right? You're being professional. I would love to move this project forward. I would like to, you know, help the team, whatever. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to have a conversation because something else has to go on the back burner. That's a perfect way to address that and set a boundary. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, exactly. Um, someone asked, is there anything about the strategies that change if you're leading a difficult conversation in a group meeting versus in a one-on-one? -on -one? Do you nope. need to change your approach? Nope. 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 Same, same uh, strategies definitely apply. Uh, if you are a team leader and you're talking with direct reports, it shows, it, it's a good question because it shows your vulnerability when you apply these. See, oftentimes, and I'm not suggesting this is what you think, but what I find in working with leaders and particularly in C-suite, that sometimes it's like, oh, well, it's going to look weak if I, you know, if I admit that, you know, or if I use I statements or I admit that, you know, I kind of catastrophize this or I sit in silence and let people, no, no, au contraire, it is a show of strength, absolutely. So, so these strategies can help you show up uh, as a strong leader in giving space to to your team if that's the scenario we're in. So no, the same the same strategies apply. Okay. All right. We've got time maybe for just one or two more. Sure. Um, sure. Karen says with virtual meetings, I find it harder to have silence. Any suggestions? Well, yeah, I, I hear you. I, I, I do so so much work virtually. So I, I hear you. And sometimes I just mark the silence. I say, we're going to take a minute here to uh, feel free to, to go off camera if you'd like. I'd like us to take a minute to kind of pause and reflect on what we've just heard and formulate any questions you might have. Feel free to go off camera or to mute yourself, uh, but I'll be here in the meantime. 
that's a nice way of kind of giving people a break. And then I'll just sit there on camera and just, you know, take notes or make notes or whatever, but mark the silence by articulating it and then and then giving people. And sometimes that's a that's a great pl place for conversations to start because when people can take a break, then they start getting creative and remembering the question that they didn't remember when right, right. they were on camera. So right. that's one right. strategy I use. This will be our last question. I know there's some questions we're not getting to, uh, but Nancy has very nicely agreed that if, if, you, if you didn't get your question answered, um, feel free to reach out to her and yes. um, she will answer it specifically for you. But we'll take yes. one last question. And this is from Mutaka. Um, thank you for the amazing presentation and responses to the questions. What do you think about involving a third party or mediator in a difficult conversation? Well, um, that can look so many different ways depending on the scenario. So I, I don't, if you're talking about in the professional setting, it depends on what it is you're discussing. So if you, if this is an emotionally charged topic between you and one other person, it can be problematic to include somebody else unless both of you agree to it. Um, if it's like a team oriented issue where you want to address something that will help the team move forward, it may be great to have a third person. I think the top of mind should be, is this emotionally charged? If I, if I bring someone else in, do I run the risk of potentially humiliating or making the other person even more uncomfortable or making me more uncomfortable? Um, should we do this in steps? Maybe try to broach the subject first with the I statements and the active listening and the all the things, and then say, would you like to, you know, include, you know, John or Jane in the next discussion so we can be more productive together? So there's lots of options mm -hmm. for you. If it's a personal discussion, you know, mediator, I always think of what I had in my divorce. Um, that's a different thing. But in a in a workplace setting, you you want to be mindful of the dynamics and the risks that you're running by including somebody else if it's not a joint decision. Okay, fabulous. Um, Nancy, a couple of people asked if they could see the QR code again. So if, oh, sure. um, maybe we can go back uh, one slide. Absolutely, um, there it is. So Nancy, thank you. There are so many great takeaways in there. I was jotting notes um, throughout the great whole- questions. Whole great questions, yeah. what, what an engaged group. Uh, these are my favorite and um, I do uh, encourage you, if you, you have a question that wasn't answered, shoot me an email, I will respond to you. And um, I do this work because I love it. And I do this work because I was crippled for so long by these same things. So I use all these strategies myself and they've changed everything for me. So I encourage you to give it a shot. Well, thank you. And Melissa, thank you thanks so for having for, me. Yes, thank you so much for sharing with us. Everybody, hope you have a great afternoon and a great holiday. And I uh, hope to see you back at another uh, future webinar. Take care, everybody.